Hi, and welcome to our Intentional Wealth Update from Morton Brown Family Wealth. I'm Dennis Morton here with Katie Brown and Cody Demmel. How are you guys? Doing great. All right, so we have three CFPs around the table today, and we're going to revisit a topic that we talked about in a blog a couple of years ago, which is money conversations in marriage. And at the time, I reflected on how my wife and I, before we got married, she thought I was broke before we sat down on the night we got engaged and started talking about our finances and laid everything out on the table. Uh, For us, that was at the beginning of our relationship, but we know that money conversations in marriage, it's tricky at all stages of life. And we wanted to check in and see, all right, how are married couples doing now post pandemic? We had some data from Fidelity. And we also want to talk about some just guideposts and ways to facilitate those conversations and integrate your advisor in it. So Katie, Fidelity did a study on just the status of retirement and some of those conversations about money and marriage. What what did you find out there? There are actually a couple of different studies. One of them, you know, going back to, to 2018 and just talking about how those conversations come to pass and how different coming into the marriage, they talked a lot about like debt levels and, and how that impacts the conversation and how that can put the stress on, on the relationship. And, and so much of it goes back to expectations. And I think this is where the conversation piece comes into place is the expectation about, okay, how are we going to tackle this together or whose responsibility is it? Or how do you think philosophically about um, debt income? spending. You can come to the marriage and say, okay, this is what I have, but it's really figuring out all right, how do we manage that together that's going to help bring that bring those stress levels down. Cody, what did you see in some of this this data about the relationship with money? I thought it was interesting on the fidelity research how different the levels were compared to the couples that were concerned about debt and the couples that didn't have any concerns about debt, just how they felt about the different decisions whether they had any arguments about money, what they thought their biggest relationship challenge was, if they had difficulty with their budgeting, just the differences between the the two, between what couples concerned about debt and then couples who feel like they have a good understanding of their debt levels. Yeah, it's like those debt levels really, it's like pouring gas on already, you know, tough conversations. It makes them that much tougher, um, which, you know, we have, you know, a lot of this debt is going to be student debt. Um, it could be mortgage debt with home prices going up. I mean, it's it's not something that's that's going away. You know, and, and these are emotional things. That's the thing about you know marriage conversations and money. Money is creates emotional responses in in us for a lot of reasons, positively and negatively. And then you have the emotional side of marriage. I mean, this is someone you love, and you're talking about money, and it's, it can be a little bit of a, of a toxic soup sometimes. I think something else that was interesting in the Fidelity study too is they talked about. You know, when couples do work with a financial advisor, kind of getting some of those prompting questions from the financial advisor can can open up the conversation and it makes that having that conversation that much easier with their spouse. So in the study, 80 percent of the respondents said it was easier to talk about spending and savings with my spouse because we work with an advisor and you know, we can see this stuff mapped out, tracked out. And it's important for us to get on the same page similar high levels when they talk about like wills and estate planning that's not always a comfortable conversation to have out of the blue but if you look at it in the bigger context of what's going on and you have an an advisor that can kind of help walk you through that a little bit then it does bring the ease of the conversation i think to the forefront yeah and and a lot of times we hear from when we initially sit down with a couple sometimes there's either extreme overconfidence or extreme underconfidence sometimes you'll hear people say i'm probably doing this all wrong and it's not wrong or right. It's just, is it consistent with what you're trying to accomplish here? Because my background, both of my parents had pensions that they were going to be receiving at the end of their, um, at the end of their lifetimes. For, for my family, we own a business. That, that's a different set of expectations. And you navigate that a little bit differently. There's no right or wrong, but it's coming to that understanding. And understanding, too. I, I think you're right. Sometimes there are, are reservations of, did I make a mistake or not? We all make the best decisions that we can with the information we have. That's, that's the bottom line. And sometimes, you know, there might be something, and we often have this conversation with clients too, there might be a numbers answer on the page, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the fit for your family. And so there has to be that, that balancing act. So while on paper, you might look and say, oh, I did the wrong thing, that you may have done the completely right thing for your family. So I just always encourage people not, not to get frustrated with past decisions. Let's just make sure we, we continue to bring kind of that open mindset going forward. And the other, the other piece from Fidelity, 
was on the state of retirement. This is something that was uh, a study that was done earlier this year. So post kind of at the tail end of the pandemic, it gives us a chance to check in and say, how are people feeling about the preparedness? What, what have we learned here? I thought this was interesting, mm -hmm. you know, looking up a year after the shutdown. So March of 2021. And during that time, we've had very strong market returns. We would have never guessed in March of 2020 that we would have ended up with a strong year in 2020, but, but we did and it continued into to 2021. And yet the majority of respondents, you know, over 50% said that they felt as if they were behind in their, re in their retirement readiness by at least one to three years. Dennis, what does that tell you about the preparedness? I, I think it's not about the markets somewhat to some extent, you know, the, the markets at this point, by, by March of 2021, the markets were well ahead of even previous highs. The drop of the pandemic had largely declined. So unless somebody got out of the market was still sitting in cash, their asset levels should have been about the same. Now there could have been job fluctuations or other things that happened, but there's this perception that they're, they've fallen behind when maybe that's just not true. They just haven't you know, taken the time to check and say, well, what are the really the conditions now? Katie, what was the number you found about perceptions about the market being up versus down, that there's this general negative sentiment that the market is usually down. That was one of the statistics that, that was in this study. 72% of respondents thought that the market was negative more often than positive over the last 35 years. When in reality, the market's been positive 26 out of those 35 years. And some of those negative years, not even that negative. Right. <laughs> the market in general has been very, very conducive to, to helping people get to that retirement readiness. The way that some individuals felt, how, how much more confident they were if they already had a plan in place before the pandemic started, or even if they did a plan plan during the pandemic, how much more confident they had compared to individuals who, who haven't had a plan. I think that goes back to what you were speaking about. The markets have still done well since the pandemic started. I mean, we're above where, where it was last year. So I think that's why the individuals that feel so well, they've had a plan in place and, and they know they're in a good spot going forward. A, a wise man once told me there are three very important words to remember in life, awareness, awareness, and awareness. And I think that, that's so much of this is if you're aware of your circumstances and not just guessing that that's where the confidence begins. But I think so many people are like, I think the market's down. I think this happened, but I, I just don't know. And I think that's the benefit of, you know, the proactive relationship with your advisor, checking in with your spouse. I mean, we, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum, one of the biggest obstacles for any spousal conversation is one person has it in their head. There's a, there's a series of spreadsheets of documents and the whole plan is in one person's noggin. I don't know if I've shared this with you guys. I call it the Lois Lane question. In the original, <laughs> in the original Superman, as Lois Lane is falling from the building and Superman swoops up from underneath her, grabs her, says, easy miss, I've got you. And her response is, you've got me, who's got you? That's that key man or key person, I'll pick on the guys. I understand that you've got it, but who's got you? And, and, and it can't always be one person the other person can get confidence by seeing it laid out on paper. So what what are some of the things that, uh, what's our role in this conversation? Like if you're trying to set expectations for, okay, you know, next time I sit down with Cody, next time I sit down with Katie, what should, what should an advisor be doing to help make these conversations of, of couples easier and, and more, more productive to build confidence? Well, I, I think there are a couple of things. Obviously, you know, asking a lot of open-ended questions. What are you concerned about, you know, individually? What are your, when you think ahead, like, what are the big goals? What, what do you think are, are your obstacles to getting to those goals? But I think there's also, there's that fiscaloscopy conversation, you know, and, and many of, of the people listening to this may have gone through this kind of exercise with us. And, and I think it's a lot of fun to learn that the individual philosophies with within the, the marriage. So husband and wife kind of independently saying, okay, this is how I think about debt. You know, if there's an opportunity to, to leverage money cheaply, then I'm fine taking on a lot of debt or the right. other end of the extreme, I don't want any debt, period. So checking in on kind of your philosophy there and then taking that to the next step to say, okay, now how do you feel about your actual levels of debt? And, and to have both of the spouses going through that, and it could be debt, it could be income spending, supporting your adult children, charitable giving. But, but I think those philosophical conversations 
and then check it, checking in on where you're at is a really great exercise and hopefully prompt some, some wonderful conversations. What do you think, Cody? What's the role of a CFP in, in kind of mediating this or being a, being a good advocate within marital conversations? Yeah, I, I completely agree um, with what Katie said. And, and going through the articles when we were before this, one of the main things that they said is just making sure you know the personality of your spouse. So whether they're a spender or a saver, I mean, even with that, being able to understand why are they feeling that way? And like Katie said, maybe they like that, but they don't want to uh, leverage it, or maybe they don't like that. So that's why they're, they're saving more. So just trying to figure out how your spouse feels about the money conversations, I think is, is really important. And it's a, it's a very, ideally, it's a non-judgmental place. Like when, when you're coming to the table and saying, I feel fearful, or I feel debt averse, or I feel those things, that's not right or wrong. That's something that, that needs to be kind of put out on the table and, and managed and addressed. But, um, you know, the, the advisor as non-judgmental advocate, I think is really an important place to be. So we encourage you to bring to the table your conversations that you've had in marriage. I mean, we, we always enjoy sitting down and kind of helping families to build that confidence. That, I mean, that's why the family wealth in our name is very intentional because these are dynamic conversations. They're ones that are always evolving. And coming out of this pandemic, there's an opportunity for couples to dream big about their finances and what that means for you know supporting their best version of life. So we encourage you to share your stories and look forward to catching up with another Intentional Wealth Update here in the coming weeks.